see what to preach. I preached at many churches, praise the Lord, this year. But for some weird reason, this service happened to be the most difficult where I had trouble on what to preach or how the Lord guided me. I believe this is where he wants me to leave off. I hope that this sermon will help you as, as you are needed in this area, as there are many people dying and going to hell, as you have a good thing going, as you're at your heyday point, you're at your growing spurt. So the importance of this ministry and you is needed to carry on God's work. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 7, a famous passage. Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? The Apostle Paul is writing to the church of Galatia, and the church of Galatia had a problem with some Jews infiltrating, giving them wrong doctrine, deviating them from how the church should be normal, normal, normally function, and how the pastor had led and guided them. But then there's something that those infiltrators did that caused the members in the church of Galatia who were soul winners, who had their doctrine stray, who started growing, who loved each other, who helped one another, and they were doing a great work for the Lord. And then all of a sudden, something threw them off. It hindered them, and it infuriated the apostle Paul. It burdened him, and he said, we were doing a great thing together. We were going to shake up this world for Christ. We're getting souls saved and then we're getting a lot of people into the church and we're helping to change lives. Who hindered you? What made you? What made you? Skip the race. Fall off the race. Ye did run well. Who did hinder you? That ye should not obey the truth. Will you bow with me in a word of prayer and pray for me? Father, I need the filling power of your spirit one more time, Lord, and the cleansing of your blood. Father, you know my heart. Uh, I do care about each and every one of these people. And Lord, I want to give something to them, Lord. And Lord, these are your children. They're more precious to you than they are precious to me. So because they're more precious to you and you count every hair on their heads and you count even all the sparrows and know every blade of grass, how much more do these children mean to you? Minister. Minister to each and every one of them. Fill me, Lord, not for my sake, not for my name or anything like that. Throw that away, Lord, just for your glory and because these people need you, Lord. Yes. Fill me, Lord. One more time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I am going to do a textual sermon. And we're going, to, we're going to concentrate mainly on this one verse. The Bible says, ye did run well. Hindrances do not happen unless you run very well. You have to run well so that hindrances can occur. The devil is not going to send an attack. The devil is not going to stir up something that will throw off the church unless there's something, the direction that you're going is right. Amen. Just happen to find this church. You happen to find a brother and sister in Christ. You discovered right doctrine. You discovered this book. You got saved and you're about to make changes and you're about to do something for the Lord. And it's at that moment that the devil will try to swoop in. If you know the parable of the seed and the sower, as soon as the word of God, the seed just lands on the ground, the devil's job is to make sure to pick it up so that the seed can't plant. It can't work in you. And that's the devil's job. Why? Because he knows you're going to receive it. God forbid that the Holy Spirit sometime in your life or sometime in the preaching when you come to this church, some seed is tossed on the ground and the Lord knows that you can be receptive and then you can receive the seed and you can grow, but some fowl of the air just swooped down and picked it up so that it doesn't work in you. And some of you have come to church today or running your race without seeds because the devil choked it up and ate it. Yes, sir. And that seed is not able to work in you. And as you come to this church and as you fellowship with the brethren and as you live your life for the Lord this time, there's no seed that's working. 
and you feel empty and you're just dragging yourself and your Christian walk feels mechanical. You only come here because your parents forced you to, because your family forced you to, because the brethren in this church forced you to. That's how you feel like. And there's no seed that's working in you. Did some foul swoop it up? Why? Because he knows that you're about to head toward the right direction. Man, do you realize that when you got saved in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have no idea what you're headed toward? Man, when the pastor and I talked about it, I mean, when he got saved, he had no idea where he would end up at. When I got saved, I had no idea where I would end up yet. I was just a Korean who was born in New Hampshire where the gospel is cold and people had no idea. Your pastor right here, he was somewhere in Tennessee. And here all of you are in Australia. And how could God get all of us together in this place over here? Have you meet us and we meet you? Only Jesus Christ knew that when he saved your soul from a burning hell, some of you three hours away, four hours away, some of you made time to come over here. And what are the odds and the chances that all of us, a hundred one of us, over a hundred of us could meet together right here in this room? Amen. What are the odds, man? Over 20 different nationalities here, meeting right here in this place, in this time. God knew once you got saved in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, I have a great work to do with you. I have a great plan if you only knew. And I'm going to bring you at this point, at this time, and use you for my glory. Do you realize that when you got saved, man, what a... What a direction you're heading toward. Where you're going to run well. Where God's going to use you mightily. Do you realize that our race has not even ended yet and we have just begun? And do you realize the race that you're running, the direction you're headed toward, the greatness will get even greater. What God will use in your life. Sure, there are valleys, but there are mountaintops to head over and to claim and say, I conquered this mountain for you, Lord. Do you realize the path that you're headed toward? And what greatness God has in store for your life to use you for his glory. But that's why that foul is going to come in. Pick up that seed before it works in you. Is that you today? Are you the one that's about to head toward a big direction? That the devil knows and picks up the seed, but you don't know. And you're so blinded that you don't see that. And something diverts you from your path. Some of you are steering off course. And you're about to, the next step you are about to make was greatness. But then the devil just deviated that step. Put you down here. Put you down over here, steering you off course. Every day that passes by is literally one step away from that course of greatness. You need to go back. Some of you need to go back. Get back on that path where God is steering you. You know, that's, that verse already gave you the clue. How do I run well? I mean, I've been hindered and I've been deviated. What It says right here, ye did run well. That means where you, the path you were on before. You ran well. There's something you did in your Christian walk as you attended this church, as you grew up in Bible-believing knowledge, as your charity grew, as your understanding of people grew, as you were getting more involved, as you were reading the Bible and praying, being discipled, growing, and there's something in there. The sacrifices that you made and the efforts that you did for Jesus Christ, there's something you're doing that is right in your course. Just get back to there. Some of you just need to come back, man. Some of you need to come back to God and you just became a prodigal son, deviated from the father and his arms have been open wide that entire time and his arms are still open. He's waiting for you. Amen. You just need to go back. You just need to come back where you were running well. That's how you stay on track. What you were running so well. Do you remember that? Oh, you forgot, didn't you? Some of you forgotten. That's why you don't know how to get back. Right. Do you remember that time when God answered that prayer 
God met your need that time in such a miraculous way and used you and you produced the fruit and that's something that you couldn't just shut up about and you just wanted to testify in front of the church and say, thank God, this is what God did for me. Did you forget that? Did you forget that time when you were first nervous and afraid and you didn't know, but you just, you gave out a track. You told that soul how to get saved in Jesus Christ. That you made yourself look like a fool, but oh, I preached on the street. I did it. I did it. Did you remember that? Or did you forget? Did you forget that time when some brother and sister in Christ here had met you in some way and reached the depths of your heart? And you couldn't help but just develop a love in return and then you and that brother and sister in Christ developed a bond and a love that's even so great and strong that you never felt it before. And you're like, man, I'm so glad for Christian fellowship. Oh, do you remember that? Get back. Get back. Do you remember that time that there was some preaching that God stirred your heart and convicted you and drew you closer? And that was it. And you... Dragged yourself on the altar. You didn't care what anybody thought. You didn't care what your flesh felt. You just came on this altar and said, Oh God, get me back to you. I repent. I give up. I sacrifice. I surrender to you. Amen. Oh, do you remember that? Do you remember that? Do you remember what, how God was doing well in your life? You need to come back to that. What happened to you? What happened? That's the thing, the next part, who did hinder you? Something hindered you. What happened? You were running so well. You were getting so involved. People thought that you're gonna keep on coming. People thought that you're gonna do something more for the glory of God. People thought that God's gonna use you in some way. And then all of a sudden, what happened to you? You thought you got a good thing going. You thought that you could grow more in the Lord. You thought that God can do something great. And what happened? Who did hinder you? Just life got so busy all of a sudden. Just snuck in. Without knowing, without you knowing, that fowl swooping in without you noticing and swiftly picking up that seed and going out. Something happened. I got extra hours on the job. I can't come that day to church. My family, and I got to take care of this for my kids, and then they have a certain game or a certain program that they got to do, and I got to take care of that. You know, work is just too tiring, and, you know, just that one time passing it is not a big deal, and I can return. Pastor said he's not going to judge us. The people aren't going to judge us. And they'll, they'll understand if I don't come that time. Because I'm just too busy. It's so far away. I can't make that long drive. And well, what about uh, once a month? Yeah, maybe I can try. But then it's already been two months. You just forgot it. Busyness turns to forgetfulness. Because you've just been caught in the hustle and bustle. Just watching TV and, you know, as long as I watch here and there, the preaching, the singing and stuff like that, I'll be okay. It becomes normalcy then. Busyness, forgetfulness, the normalcy in your own way of doing things. And you wonder why you're discontented, you're sad right now, and you don't feel like God's using your life. Busyness got to you. It's just so much schoolwork and studies, exams, it's finals. And then you just forget. Finals passed, you forget, and you're just used to that routine of being busy. And when's the last time we saw you? Money ran out, so I don't have the, the money, the support where I can get more involved in church and help out, and I don't have a ride. And who did hinder you? Who did hinder you? I'm sick, I have bad health, I can't get back, and who did hinder you? Now look, I'm not, I mean, God forbid, I don't judge anybody for that. People have legitimate reasons why they cannot come, why they cannot get much involved. But my friend, you have to realize that sometimes we get so comfortable with our legitimate reasons, 
legitimate reasons soon become illegitimate reasons. Because we legitimize the legitimate reason so much that it becomes illegitimate. Or was that too deep for you? Now that has been your calling card. The calling card of, why I can't read my Bible? This one! Because you're used to calling out this legitimate reason. So it's like a flag, then you wave it up. This is the reason why I can't do it, God. Why, why don't you get involved in fellowship right here? And oh, this is my reason right here. Well, why can't you spend time in prayer? This is my reason right here. Uh, you know, we have a church service right here. This is my reason right here. Yes. You're so used to doing that, waving that calling card. Who did hinder you? Who did hinder you? Trial sure gets to people. Suffering. Somebody loses a loved one, their health catches up to them and their health gets worse. Sickness. Fear. Fear. Some of you are afraid to come back to this church. Some of you are afraid to get your life back in order and to trust God. Some of you are afraid of letting go of something that you're comfortable to, your comfort zone. And you need to let it go and go by faith and trust God and serve Him. Who did hinder you? Trial and affliction gets to all of us and you just get worn out. You get worn out. Especially, you know, as you get so used to getting involved in a Bible-believing church, so used to getting involved in serving God in your quiet time with Him, so used to staying away from sin in the world. And then as you get so used to that, you just get... It just becomes mechanical, then you get weary, and then you get discouraged. And as you're serving God and doing the right thing, something happens that lets you down. It didn't meet your expectation. And you go, oh, why did that happen? And then weariness turns to spite. Weariness in the work of God turns to spite because it didn't meet your expectation somewhere then you deviate from your path and you get off course. Right. Who did hinder you? Who did hinder you? It's a matter of not looking at these imperfections here and there, but a matter of my walk with Jesus Christ where he called me to do. And if those imperfections remain, let those things be imperfect. But my path must be perfect and I must stay on course and overlook all the imperfections and move on for Jesus Christ. Because I'm too much worried about myself rather than those things out there. It becomes nitpicky and critical and then we pick on all these things out there that could have been better, that could have been better, that could have been better. Yeah, your life could be much better if you stop doing that. Right. Amen. Your life could be much better if you can stop doing that and move on for God. The world can be enticing. The world can seem easier. It can seem easier. I remember those, that time when I was able to just sleep on a Sunday. I didn't have to. <laughs> Man, look at this. I mean, you have to dress up like this, you know. It's harder than going to work sometimes, you know, when you dress up like this. I got to do this Sunday and Sunday. Oh, and then the world's way seems to be easier sometimes. Just to tire, just watch TV. Everybody in the world's doing that or on the Internet. Hey, I watched some Bible-believing stuff, so hey, I'm still right with God, you know. And then right next to that in your recommended channel, there's that godless Netflix show or something that you're watching on the side. Sure. Sure. The world can be enticing, and then the world just seems better. So then, let me stick around a church that, you know, they love Jesus. They love Jesus, but, you know... Uh, even though you call it a worldly church, uh, I'm going to serve God over here because it's easier. It's closer in distance. Because they seem to have a more sweet spirit over there and they're not that mean and cruel. And, you know, they have more programs for my kids to get involved with. I just happen to like that preacher better because he, he just seems more positive than that one. This, the world seems enticing. It just fits my preference, fits my personality, fits my culture, it fits my taste. So let me do this thing. No, no. I know the world's way of doing things is easier. 
And you want to stick to that one. But that gets you out of your race. That gets you out of your race. Who did hinder you? Do you, do you see what hindered you? What prevented you? What would get you back on track? No matter how great the hindrance is, you know what would get you back on track? That verse again, ye did run well. That track that you were committed, that thing that got you into there. You forgot, didn't you? You forgot what got you into that path. What was it? It was simply the truth. It was simply Jesus Christ. It was saving your soul from hell and that you wanted to be in a real, genuine truth and live your life in truth and in joy and in the Holy Ghost away from the world. Too much lies in this world, darkness, apostasy, and sin. You wanted something clean. A commitment like that was what made you run well to begin with. Amen. What made you come to this revival meeting? Everyone here sacrificed, sacrificed, put an extra effort to come here. Why? Something is drawing you to keep on running. What made you committed? What made you commit? Why did I come here to Australia? Something makes me committed here. What made you commit? What is that anchor that got you here? You need to discover that. You need to go back in your past. You need to look at your life, look at your heart and see, what made me commit here? What made me stay in the course? What made me not deviate off course? I need to find it so that I can drag myself back into the race no matter how weak my flesh is. If there's something you really love, something that you really put all your heart to and you put your commitment to, it will make you stay in the race no matter how tired your life is, no matter how bad suffering is, and no matter how busy your life is, and no matter what kind of hindrance the enemy sends in your life, you're going to stay. But see, the devil knows what's making you committed if you don't. He knows what made you lock in, and that's why he attacks that. He attacks that. And when he attacks it, if what, you, if what you loved, what made you committed, made you stay in that race, the devil's going to attack that and lower your expectations. If it was Jesus Christ that made you stay in that race, then he's going to attack Jesus Christ and make you go, why did bad things happen? If there really is a God, Jesus really loved me, why did this bad thing happen? Why did my child die? Why does unfairness happen? When you came to this church, it's like, man, there's brothers and sisters in Christ, Bible believers, this is just great, and we're trying to grow in the Lord together, and then the devil attacks that, and you go, oh, that brother, that sister, that preacher, that child over there, that teacher over there, that is just imperfect here and there, and then gets you out of that race. What made you committed over here? It's the truth. It's the word of God, man. I found out about the King James Bible and dispensationalism. That's what got me here. And then the devil attacks that. Then you watch more stuff on dispensationalism. You find other preachers out there online that claim they're dispensationalists. Then they turn out, oh, they're mid-acts. They're hyper-dispensational. And then, you know what? They were right about that negative thing, they, uh, they were right about Ruckman. He was wrong right there. They were right about that Bible-believing preacher, teacher. They're wrong right there. And what? I didn't know about that scandal. And see, then the devil attacks that, gets you out of the race. What made you commit here? If you don't know, the devil knows. And he's attacking that. You need to overcome that thing. You need to overlook those things. You need to restore. You need to restore. You need to renew that commitment in the Lord. Like King David said, renew within me a right spirit, a clean heart. Renew the commitment today in Jesus Christ. So you can stay in the race. So you can stay committed. Maybe in that commitment, why did all those bleak things have to happen why did those attacks have to happen against your commitment because God is trying to test you 
to make you see a more realistic side to it and see how really committed you are. And get rid of all those fantastical false expectations you have of the commitment and make you see the more realistic things, which includes the ugliness within it. And you don't like those ugly parts, but God says you need to overcome that. And as you overcome it, the beautiful sides of that commitment becomes even more beautiful. What God does with the bad, he turns it into something that's even more beautiful beyond your dreams. Amen. That's right. And what happens if it was love for the brethren that made you committed to begin with and made you stay? Then as you see the ugly parts as you love the brethren, and then you overcome it by the grace of God, the love becomes even more beautiful. And then this love for the brethren becomes so strong, it be overcomes the bleak stuff. The, it overcomes the odds. And the love for the brethren becomes so beautiful that this love for the brethren is far more beautiful than the original love for the brethren you had before that draw you to this church, that drew you to be committed to God. Do you understand what I mean right here? Is that... Whatever has made you commit and stay in the race, when you see the bleak parts and overcome it, God will make it even more beautiful. And you would go, I don't know about you, but the, for some of you, some of you might know what I'm talking about if you got saved for 20 years, 30 years. And those stuff, as you live your Christian life and you go through suffering and you see the ugly parts, the imperfect parts and the bleak parts, the stuff that makes you lose and fall out of the race. When you overcome that, you thank God actually for those bad parts all of a sudden. You thank God for the ugly parts. You thank God how he opened your eyes and how they became even more beautiful. And your love for God grew 10 times more after suffering rather than before suffering. Yes, sir. Who did hinder you? Who did hinder you? That ye should not obey the truth. It says that ye should not obey. You know what comes down to when we uh, fall out of our race, when we don't press on? It's because of so-and-so right there. That's why I can't serve God anymore. Get my life together. It's because of my mom and dad, and you don't know the childhood that I went through. And because of that, that's the reason why I fell off to the world. It's because of my health, and I can't keep going on. It's because of this. It's this and this and this. No, what it comes down to, believe it or not, it's not those things to blame. It comes down to you disobeyed God. Plain and simple, you disobeyed God. God says, lay your body as a living sacrifice. Serve me, commit yourself to me and stuff like that. Oh God, well I can't do it because of this. Oh God, it's too hard because of this. Oh God, oh God, oh God. That's disobedience. Adam and Eve, they ate the fruit, right? They ate the fruit. What, is, what was that the sin of? Disobedience. Yeah. Do you think they realized that? Or did they say, it's not me, it's uh, what you created and gave to me. If that didn't happen, then I wouldn't eat the fruit. The woman, I, I didn't know. I was tricked, the serpent, clever. The devil's so clever, you couldn't help it. I'm the weaker vessel. The serpent knew. He didn't give any excuse. He knew better. You know, isn't it amazing that the judgment seat of Christ, every single human being, will give all these excuses to God for their disobedience, but the devil won't. Why? The devil's more mature than some of you Christians. The Bible says children of disobedience. Why? The devil is the prince of that. He knows what it clearly is. I disobeyed God, period. That's what it comes down to, my friend. You disobeyed God. Your life is not a life of obedience, but a life of disobedience to the Father. 
And it comes down with God as he allows some tough things to happen in your life. And then he says, do you love me? Do you sacri will, you will, will you willingly sacrifice? Will you still serve me? I know that this thing happened, that thing happened, but are you willing to overcome those things, overlook those things, go through those things and just serve me? Will you, so it comes down to obedience or not obedience. You read the Bible, you went to church, you prayed, you stayed away from sin, yes or no, that's it, not I couldn't read the Bible because of this. I couldn't go to church because of this. I couldn't stay away from sin because of this. No, it comes down to yes or no. Obedience or disobedience. Deep down inside the heart, you can give a million excuses, but you know what it is. And the depths of your heart is screaming out, you disobeyed God. It's because you don't want to obey God. You don't want to obey Him. You don't want to listen to Him. Every time the Lord, oh, Holy Spirit's convicting your heart or there's some kind of preaching or God is dealing with you, get right, repent, reconcile, get back, trust God, have faith, overcome the fear, stay away from sin, get over yourself, and then you go, no, I don't want that. I don't want to obey. I don't want to listen. Stop, let me do it my way. Disobedience. It comes down to that. My last part right here is the truth. The truth. Ye did run well, who did hinder you that ye should not obey? The truth. I know what we can see right here on the truth. A lot of you ended up here because of the truth, amen? A lot of you were searching for truth, amen? amen? Then why get off course? Because, like I told you, what made you committed here to begin with, if it's the truth, maybe that's why you started, right? right. If that was the case, then it's because that thing you are committed to, the truth, your expectation of it, your fantasy of it, didn't meet that level. Why? The Lord is testing your heart. And then sometime along the road, the devil's attacking what you're committed to, and you cannot overcome it, and then you fall out of the race. It was dispensationalism. King James Bible is the word of God. Right doctrine, and yeah. But what if the deeper truth is this? What if the deeper truth why you didn't obey it, why you fell out of the race, is deeper than you did not obey right doctrine. You did not obey, you know, the King James onlyism. You did not obey dispensational truth. You did not obey. What if you did not obey and the truth is you need to get over yourself? Amen. What if the truth is you need to give that up and surrender to the Lord? What if the truth is you are wrong? What if the truth is you need to shed more grace and love to that brother and sister in Christ? Amen. What if the truth is you need to commit your life more to Jesus rather than giving excuses? Right. What if the truth is you're lazy? What if the truth is you're stubborn? What if the truth is you're weak? What if the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart what if the deep tr truth inside your heart that you don't want to face, that you don't want to hear is, I'm just afraid, I'm discouraged, and I'm weak, and I'm a babe, still a babe in Christ, and I need help, and I need to grow, and I need the Lord to guide my hand and hold me up. You don't want to face that truth. You don't want to admit your weakness. You don't want to admit your flesh. You don't want to admit your prideful. You don't want to admit that you need more of God. You don't like that truth. That's why, that's why you're out of the race. Because one day when God puts you through suffering, he shows you that truth. You see your weakness here. You see what you really are. You see what you need to sacrifice and surrender. But you won't. You won't obey that. You refuse to surrender to that. And you're running away from that.
That's what gets you out of the race is what if the deeper truth inside today is I need to get on this altar and I need to humble myself. And the deep truth inside why I got out of the race is not because of work, it's not because of bitterness, it's not because of brother, sister, and so-and-so, it's not because of this, it's because, God, I'm weak. And I'm afraid. And I'm alone and I need your help from on high. But I'm just too ashamed. I just got too much pride. I just don't want to admit it. I just don't want to say it. I don't have the guts to say it to my brother and sister in Christ or to my pastor. Oh, God, now I confess. Will you obey that truth and come? And then perhaps the devil won't use that weakness of yours to get you out of the race again. Pastor.